Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wadcast Podcast. I am your host, Eddie Ift, and each and every week I bring you an episode of the Wadcast where I speak to the top people in strength, conditioning, health, fitness, nutrition, wellness, CrossFit, whatever it may be, we talk to them. I bug them. I get their information. It's my way of picking their brain and finding out all the stuff that I want to know and hope that you guys had the same questions. Uh, I am a comedian by nature and uh, like to stay active and do all kinds of things from skiing, mountain biking, surfing, running, you name it. And uh, as I get older, I try to stay healthy and stay active. I got two little, two little kids that, that, beat the shit out of me on a daily basis. So uh, my daughter had me out skiing yesterday and uh, it's not easy. So uh, I do everything I can to stay fit, stay healthy and uh, and also do this with a bit of cynicism and also a bit of uh, a bit of uh, I try to bring you some entertainment value. So I hope you are enjoying the episodes. Uh, today's episode, we have an incredible guest. Uh, very infrequently do we have a a, a listener of the show on. He's not just a listener. And, and some of the people that are the guests in the past have been listeners also. Some of the famous CrossFitters or whatever they may be, they do listen to the show. Uh, but this guy, that's how I got a hold of him. Um, he and I have corresponded many times, uh, through social media and, uh, he's a very knowledgeable guy and he's got an extensive, extensive background, not just in CrossFit, uh, where he does have his, uh, certifications, but he's also a martial arts guy and has martial arts websites and martial arts podcast. And, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's hardcore. So, um, we don't talk martial arts much on the show and I think we should talk it more, especially since I'm, I mean, I think I'm going to dip my foot into jujitsu. Uh, who knows? Why not? You know, when you're, when you're at the back nine of life, why not do something where you can break every bone in your body and get choked out? Sounds like fun. So, um, Today's guest is Jeremy Lesniak, who I uh, met up with him in Worcester, Massachusetts while I was doing shows up there and uh, had an incredible conversation, which it could have gone forever. Hung out with him the rest of the night. We, he went, went to my show. He uh, we went and had dinner that night. Uh, that's that's probably the best aspect of doing this show is getting to meet these amazing guests and spending time with them. Um, I have an episode coming up with Louise Eberts, who is my gymnastics go to if you've ever been to uh if you want to go to her instagram it's louise ebert's gymnastics she's a freak uh just uh, the best coach i think there is out there when it comes to gymnastics just go look at her coaching cues or coaching drills everything for crossfit uh when it comes to gymnastics uh, i don't think you can do any better and uh, i was telling her she's got to have seminars so if you want to get her find her get her to come to your your place and do a seminar because she does them up in Vancouver and they're incredible. Um, yeah. So, uh, going to Australia soon and, uh, I'm leaving on Monday and, uh, probably get James Newberry when I'm down there. I don't know who else to interview. Send me some messages. If you know of anyone down in Australia that you think I'm only going to be in Adelaide and Melbourne, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing to interview some interesting people. I might get Rory Sloan. who's the captain of the Adelaide Crows, uh, footy team. Uh, he's a really good guy and a friend of mine. And the, if you've ever watched AFL, they're the fittest guys in the world. So, um, love to hear, you know, what makes him so special because he is. And, uh, that's it. So I'll be, uh, I'll be the show schedule as it comes up is, um, I'm going to be in Melbourne, Australia at the comics lounge on uh that's right in north melbourne i believe and i will be there uh february 19th 21st and 22nd i'm not doing a show on the 20th and then i head to the adelaide fringe festival the adelaide fringe festival i will be there from the 24th to the 8th of march doing shows at in the garden of unearthly delights Tickets are available at eddieift.com. And then I come back and I'm going away right again. Uh, I'm sure my wife's going to love that. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm home for like a week. Uh, but I have a big, big show, my birthday show. Come out. 
Come out to my birthday show. Um, tickets are going on sale right now, so you better get them because it sells out. I do these shows regularly, about once a month at the Comedy Store, and I get all my friends to be on the show. Uh, I've been doing comedy 25 years, so the stand-up comedians I know are everybody who has been around forever. And if they're around, I get them on my show, and it's a pretty special lineup usually. And I'm not joking. It sells out so quickly. There's not a seat in the place. If you've been to one, you know what I'm talking about. It's one of the hottest shows at the comedy store, which is the arguably one of the best comedy clubs in the world. I'd call it top three. Uh, the comedy cellar in New York, the comedy store in London and the comedy store in, ah, oh, Sydney's got a great comedy store, any comedy store. They're all great. Uh, but come out and see the show. Then I head to, um, Michigan. I'm going to be at the comedy showcase in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I always love that. That's a great club to perform at. I just love the low ceiling makes, makes me feel funny. Comedy is all about low ceilings and, uh, cold air. The, it's got to be cool in the room. Uh, then, where am I going? I'm off that next weekend. Wow. I have a weekend off. Are you kidding me? How great is that? Then I'm heading to Denver. This is a very important date. I'm doing Denver, Colorado, one night only on a Wednesday night at the uh, Comedy Works in Denver. I want to sell this place out, and I want a lot of CrossFitters there. So I'm going to reach out to all the CrossFit gyms in Denver to try to get you guys there. Um, and then I'm going back to Sun Valley, Idaho to the RGO's theater, uh, where I was sold out two shows last time I was there. So let's, uh, let's, let's try to sell that puppy out. That's on Friday, the third Sun Valley. Um, uh, that's in Idaho at Ketchum, Ketchum Sun Valley resort. And then I think I'm going to head up to Bozeman, uh, Bozeman on the, uh, fourth or fifth. Uh, and then dates after that, Arizona, you can come see me at, um, the house of comedy in April. Um, uh, I have, my wife's not picking up her phone. Do you hear that? It's just really annoying. Yep. She's just going to let it ring. That's what she does. She just, she never picks up her phone. And men always pick up their phone. Women. I don't think so. Um, Atlanta punchline first weekend in May. That's, uh, it's actually the, the, Last day in uh, April, the 30th. That's a 30. And then May 1st and 2nd. May 1st and 2nd. And June, there's a whole bunch of dates. Pit Cleveland. I'm going to do Cleveland. Hilarities at Pickwick and Frolics. I'm doing the fun, uh, the improv in Pittsburgh. Then I'm headed to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And then I'm headed to uh, North Carolina, Omaha, Nebraska, just check out all my tickets at eddieift.com. You guys have been really good about starting to show up to my shows. I have people show up. They're big fans of uh, of the show, and uh, you guys have been great supporters of the show. I appreciate it. Um, the ways you can support the show is a few ways. Go on to uh, iTunes and leave a review, rate, review, comment. That's all you got to do, and uh, – it's real easy. Just write a review. I don't care. It could be funny. Just make sure you give us five stars because that works with their algorithm. Do you understand that? Uh, Apple has a way of ranking shows and they can't read your review, but they can take your ranking. So um, I prefer a funny review if you want to write one that's funny, but whatever you do, just please leave one. I like nice ones too. Um and you can give to the Patreon. That's a really nice thing to do. If you give up to five bucks a month, if you do five bucks a month, five bucks, that's a dollar an episode practically. I don't know why my dogs are spazzing out. Hey, hey, come here right now. Come here. The little one is the bad one. The big one listens. The little one never listens and just barks, barks, barks. Um, But the... Uh, yeah, if you go to Patreon, it's at uh, wadcastpodcast.com slash Patreon or go to patreon.com slash wadcastpodcast. You give just a it's, – it's a $5 a month donation and you can be the winner, the winner of our drawing each week where you get a Myopux and a Leopard Claw. The Myopux is a TENS machine and electronic muscle stimulator. Best thing for injury recovery. You need to get yourself a Myopux. If you don't have one and you can't win one, then 
buy one, but it's easy to win one. So uh, donate to the show, five bucks a month, and you could win one. Um, and the Leopard Claw is a scraper that scrapes all your adhesions, anything you've got in your body that needs, uh, you know, when you get those bumps and bruises and things that need to kind of break up all the fascia so that you've got blood flow there. Uh, get And these guys come together. You get both of them. All you got to do is five bucks a month. Our winner this week, Jeremy Williamson, longtime listener. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for supporting, listening, and uh, send an email to wadcastpodcast at yahoo.com, and we will take care of you, Jeremy. Thanks for your support, and um, hope you guys enjoy this episode with uh, with uh, another Jeremy. Jeremy Lesniak. So uh, that's it, guys. And, uh, enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wadcast Podcast. I am your host, Eddie Ift. Uh, like always, it's a very strange episode. Uh, I don't know how to explain this one. I'm in sitting in the lobby of a, of a hotel in Worcester, Worcester, Massachusetts. You said it right. Worcester. Um, and uh, I'm sitting here with a, uh, I don't know how, we, I, long time, long time listener. Uh, I hate to use the word fan. I like to use the word friend of the show. Uh, has been listening since you're like day one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I found the show like within three months of it's launch. You guys crazy. had no idea what was going on. We still don't. <laughs> we still, there's no we anymore. It's me and Ernie. Uh, but, uh, that's Jeremy Lesniak, everybody. If he, I mean, he's up there with Gordon Wagner and Garth Willoughby. Yeah. Gordon, Garth, what's going on? Gordon and Garth have never been on the show. Though. Right. Neither one of them I, has ever I, made. I it. have to admit, when we when we talked about this, when we got this set up, that was one of the things that I wanted to make sure we we shouted out was the fact that I am now on the show, Gordon and Garth. We had a fan on the show, friend, uh, a long time ago though, um, who had an interesting story. And you know, I feel terrible. I think it's like old age or just like too much shit I've done in my life now. <laughs> That I st- like, I never. I have like supposedly everybody thinks I have an incredible memory. I can remember stories. If they like make a mark on me, I can tell you like, no, no, man, you went left, I went right. And they're like, no, no, I went right, you went left. But there are people that have been guests of the show that come back on for a second time, and you're like, oh, welcome to the show for the first time. Yeah, yeah. Or if halfway like through the conversation, I'm like, oh my god, I have talked to this person on this show before. Yeah, I, I have the same experience. So, you know, I mentioned to you a little bit, I, I have a podcast, not at all in, in the CrossFit space. It's in martial arts and, you know, we'll probably talk about martial arts, but we're... That's what we're going to talk about. We're coming up on 500 episodes. Wow. And in the first 100 episodes, I could have told you... Plug your show. What's almost your show every, every guest. It's called Martial Arts Radio. Martial Arts Radio. Yeah. That's pretty uh, broad and probably brings a lot of people to it. Yeah. Really, really good yeah, it's, not, it's a nice... Uh, I suck at naming things. Everything we do is really generic, you know, martial arts radio. We have a, a online that, magazine called Martial Journal. But that brings people there. When people yeah. are looking and they're like, hey, I just want to get into this or I like it. Where do I find it? That's probably the first one that pops up. So that's actually good branding. Whereas people, when I tell people this is called the Wadcast, they're like, what? what? What's Wad? What's that? Is this about? a sex show? Yeah, yeah, they always think it's yeah. like my my comedy friends think it's like all porn. I'm talking about. I'm like, no, only half the time. Mm. Sorry, I'm drinking some horrible protein shake that has like the worst things in it that you could possibly have. But I need something. Ugh, I'm gonna die probably today if I do. It tastes terrible. Um, I, but I'm on the road, so I can't. You know. Beggars can't be choosers. So, how what, what's your martial art? Which art are you a martial? I'm in? I'm pretty broad. I mean, I've been training since I was four. Mm. You know, thirty six years of training. Uh, I've I've had some amazing opportunities in part because of what I do professionally now. The weirdest thing just went through my head. I was like, throw a punch at his stomach right now and see how he defends it. <laughs> You know, the funny thing about that is it would probably end up breaking the recorder. 
I can see where that would go, and your fist would end up in what, the recorder. What would have, have this abrupt cut off in the conversation? Let's, let's just say I was a psychopath, which I'm not. But let's say I just went like that. It would have been the elbow. Yeah, yeah it's that okay. elbow. Okay. Closest weapon, closest target. Okay. So, Same idea for defense. So, what, what what is the one that you're best at? Would you say? So I was raised in karate. You know, I I, I grew up. You know, 1983, back when very few people had kids' classes. I just was in this tiny little town in Maine and. Daniel LaRusso shit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, that kind of idea, other than, you know, I wasn't uh, 30 posing as a high school student uh, with, uh, you know, I'm hanging still, out with Pat Morita. I'm still doing that. <laughs> it's a good time. It's a good look, right? Uh, but just lucked out. This tiny little town offered some kids classes, and it completely changed the trajectory of my life. Are you a black belt in karate? I am. Okay. How long did it take you to become a black belt in karate? Um, 12 years. Wow. That's always a question I think everybody wants to know because everybody thinks about it and everybody would like to be good at martial arts, but nobody would want to put the work in. Right. And it's, you know, it's interesting because we we talk about that standard in the martial arts and and the standard is is a black belt. And of course, that standard is completely different, not just in different martial arts, but in different schools. You know, there are schools where you can quote unquote earn a black belt in a year or two and then other schools where it might take 10, 12 15 years depending right and they're not necessarily the same thing because there's no standardization there, there isn't no it, it is it is completely left completely up to free market you know and and that causes a lot of frustration for some people but do you really want to regulate it yeah but i would like to kind of go to that one school where the guy's like i'm there for a week and he's like you're a black belt and i'm like thanks dude let's have a beer i mean then, you, you can go buy one and then i mean you can buy one online right i now know it's 450 and i guess i could wrap it around your waist and pretend you know how to tie it yeah i don't even know that you know a quarter of the people out there wearing them don't know how to tie them so you and i are probably some similar generation or whatever when i was a kid i like or no in retrospect i'm like why did my parents not take me to karate? Like, I would have loved to have taken it because I got the shit kicked out of me a lot. And I always wanted to, and I feel like karate, not only like if you, you never fought because everybody knew you knew it. So they didn't want to fuck with you. Like there was a kid in on my school, John Truchuk, who knew it. And he was like a black belt and just no one ever messed with him. You know, it was yeah. one of those things of like, he's like a ninja. <laughs> but uh, but everybody knew I didn't know how to fight, so everybody tried to fight me because I had a big mouth. Well, I, w- I won't say that everybody avoided me because of martial arts, but I think they they didn't get the reaction out of me that they wanted. You know, people poke at you, and, and I mean, it's not like it, it's just when you're a child. As an adult, people poke at you. They're trying to get a response, and... You know, obviously, like I just said, I was going to throw yeah, a punch. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that guy, what would you do if, right? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty popular thing. Uh, the other one that we get all the time is show me a move, and right. the one that I usually do is turn and walk away. Yeah, that's a funny one, right? Um, but as a kid, I mean, you, you can see I'm a small guy. You know, in in high school, I was how big are you? Five seven when I wake up. Uh huh. You know, five six by the time I go to bed. Yeah. And how much you weigh? Uh, now one seventy five, but back in high school, I was one twenty five. Wow. You know, uh, and, you know, not intimidating at all. But and karate doesn't work a lot with leveraging, does it? It, it does. And, and, you know, when we talk about when we say karate, you know, there are so many different styles and there's so many different ways of teaching it. I mean, we've got the same thing in CrossFit. You know, cro- what is CrossFit now? You know, it's spidering off. It's doing all of these things. And, yeah, and there's 7,000 hybrids now. Right. And that's and, and I think one of the things that I love about CrossFit is that I see so many similarities with martial arts. And that's honestly what got me into it in the first place is, is a lot of those corollaries. But Did you start using CrossFit as kind of a just an add to your disciplines to like yeah. add to your martial arts? You were like, well, here's going to be my conditioning aspect. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Is it the best thing for martial arts for conditioning? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it really is because when you've got the, you know, if we take the definition of CrossFit, you know, the broad time and modal domains, that right. whole thing, the idea that when you're in a martial arts class, because I, I don't, I'm not stepping into the ring. I'm not training for a fight. I'm training for life. To me, martial arts is about personal development. It's about, you know, becoming better. It's a, it's a skill set. It's a community. It's all of these things. I'm not, I'm not fighting anybody. Yeah, I, I, I get a little bit of it that 
it's something to nerd out on too. Absolutely. Like, like I play chess a lot and I want to get better and better and better. A- anything I do, I want to get better. I feel like martial arts is something you can re. I look at jujitsu a lot like I look at uh, chess. Yeah. Oh, undoubtedly. And, and, and in fact, I think that's a really great analogy for BJJ is that it is very much like a chess match because it's BJJ is interesting as a martial art because it's really hard to practice on your own. Yeah. You know, how much fun is playing chess on your own? No, it's it's, impossible. it's, it's I mean, you can practice some openings, you can, yeah. you know, you can work through some sequences and you can do the same thing with BJJ, but you need the benefit of a partner. You need somebody to work with and play moves. Is BJJ, do you do the same thing in chess where you'll sucker somebody into a move? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So absolutely. That you can then do another move. And I think any combat discipline has that, you know, you've got, you, you bait people, you know, get them to, to take what you're, you're leaving out there and they think, oh, I've got them. But you were so. Ha- I mean, ahead. you you do a martial arts podcast, so I just assume you've studied a lot of them. Can you? I, tell I've me, trained in a number tell, of things. Tell yes. me, tell me all the ones you've trained in. <laughs> um, I've trained in a number of different karate schools: uh, kickboxing, taekwondo, judo. Done some BJJ. I mean, right now I'm active in four different martial arts schools. <laughs> and what are they? What kind? Of- uh, Karate, Taekwondo, Kempo, kickboxing. What's Kempo again? Kempo, think of it as um, the, the easiest way I describe it. And if anybody listening is a Kempo or Kenpo, because there's a fight about whether it's an M or an N, which is a whole bunch of bullshit we don't need to get into. Um, they're not going to like this description, but it, it's pretty apt. If you think about the fluidity of Kung Fu and, mm-hmm. and Chinese martial arts, mm-hmm. but more the techniques of like, Japanese karate. Okay. It's kind of a combo of the two. So... Taking karate, did you feel like? I mean, this is coming from a completely ignorant standpoint. Yeah, cool. Like I don't know much about martial arts other than just the few people I talk to that do them. From what I gather, karate kind of became a bit antiquated, or there were like when it came to a fight, there were better ways to fight. Uh, hence, you know, BJJ and Muay Thai. That it was. Um, I, I just don't see a lot of the – I think I talked to Joe Rogan about that one time on his show about how he said, you're going to end up on the ground. So you're going to need to know how – you know, grappling's only going to do so much like wrestling. You're going to need to know how to choke. So Brazilian jiu-jitsu is going to get you there. And he said when you're fighting, you know, the the kickboxing, you know – you're punching and swinging away and kicking. So that's a little more um, applicable to a fist fight than, say, karate. Is that true? Am I off? And am I, and am I paraphrasing You're, Joe wrong? Um, I mean, I listen to Joe's show, not every episode, because, you know, I only have so much time. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, his nine-hour marathons are... I don't know how Joe so, does it. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I don't either. No. I don't either. No I mean, my, my shows are an hour long, and I know how much they take out of me. Different martial arts can be taught dramatically differently by different people. So you could take the same, you know, you could take me and somebody that that came up with me in the same karate school and we could go and teach karate and it could be completely different. Even though what we were taught was the same because the way you look at it, again, Mm -hmm. like CrossFit, you can have the same methodology, but what you're bringing to it based on everything, the entirety of your experience completely varies. Gotcha. Gotcha. So when we talk about a fight, is that fight on the street and unexpected? Is that fight in the ring? Is that fight one-on-one? Is that fight, you know, three-on-one? And one of the things that, that I've always said is a well-rounded martial artist is a better martial artist. Sure. You know, I don't feel that we have to argue, oh, it's BJJ or karate. Why not both? But CrossFit was all about efficiency. It was like, hey, let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this. If we only have so much time and we want to get to be the fittest person we can be, let's do this, 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 and this. If you were going to try to get in the ring or let's just say get in the ring and fight, yeah. what do you need? Yeah, and, and I think you see that in, in the UFC when, yeah. when you look at mixed martial arts. And, and to be clear, you know, I am not a mixed martial artist. I, I, I have respect for what those folks do, but I draw a pretty hard line between what I call traditional martial arts and mixed or some people call modern 
right. martial arts. And they all end up with roughly the same combo. You know, you've got some, some Muay Thai, you've got some BJJ, and then most of them bring in one other thing that they often started in. You know, oh, that guy was, you know, has a bunch of boxing background, or right. that guy's a karate guy, or that guy started off with wrestling. Yeah. And they all, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like chess pieces. You know, they work in different situations. Mm-hmm. With varying degrees of efficiency. Are there any guys that have everything? You know, like you look at like David Goggins, how he was like, you know, Army Ranger, Navy SEAL, uh, Air Force Recon or whatever it was. Are there any martial artists that are like black belt karate, black belt jujitsu, black belt, you know? There are people who, who think they have everything. Yeah. But there's so much to learn and to work on that... It's not like you get to develop that skill and then put it in your pocket and it's there forever. It's going to degrade. I know because you look at like uh, McGregor, you know, fighting against Mayweather. You know, right. you just you're never going to be like you if you're a mixed martial artist, you're never going to be a specialist. You're, exactly. You, you can't. Exactly. You know, every, and when people say, oh, he might be. No, he won't even come close. <laughs> There's no way he will beat him. There, there was a moment. So no, I, there I was never there, a moment. There was a, there was a moment in that first round where. Mayweather took a step back and I remembered it because I was waiting for that moment where he said, oh, I actually have to respect this guy's technique. I think he played with him the entire time. Oh, he did. He did. But there's there's a difference. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, anybody who's been training in any kind of combat sport for a long time can can step in with somebody who's pretty new and and play you know and you yeah. can you can bring yourself down you can bring yourself up and i guess it doesn't even have to be combat sport it could be you know at tennis it could be golf and you know you could be messing around but then you can get caught off guard you get caught off guard and you look at it and you're like oh okay well yeah well, i guess i have to actually care a little bit here yeah you know i i've um this tooth is a crown and it's because i did not respect someone's technique you know, just all of a sudden this hooray. I, to this day, have no idea how the, how the foot connected with my face. Wow. Because it was the most awkward kick you felt like I'd cowboy. seen. And it just, <laughs> oh, it was in my face and tooth was snapped off in half. And actually, I was, I went to college here in Worcester. So okay, what's it was cool? down here, Clark. Okay. Did, uh, I just performed it. I think it's Worcester State one time. Uh, did, did you watch the last fight, the McGregor? Is it Not live, but yeah. after, yeah. <laughs> you saw the 40 seconds? Yeah. It was... Do you think they called it too early? <sighs> Probably not. Would it have changed the outcome? I don't know. Because I've seen some of those guys that take such a beating. You're like, this guy's done. And then all of a sudden... Like you said, like all of a sudden they get some kind of weird little advantage or the other guy gets tired out and, and there they go. And, and so I don't know. I feel like it's too much money, 80 million, 20 million. It's, a it's lot. like, it's a lot it's like of money. I'm going to tap you out. You can punch me in the face yeah, for that yeah. much money. I, I used to say I wouldn't get in the ring with Tyson even for all that money, but I watched that and like McGregor's as deadly or more deadly. And I watched what happened. Like, Exactly the punch. I'd do it for twenty million. I would do. See, it. I, I would. I would step in with McGregor. I, I would lose horrendously. Yeah. I well, yeah, I'd lose a lot Tyson worse than you would because yeah. I might die. Yeah, that's the way I think that's about it. That's the difference: is the amount of power coming off the end of that man's hand. Yeah. Is yeah. dramatically different. I mean, I'm sure I could die from McGregor too. Absolutely. Easily, but I Probably feel not like from one punch. But I feel like there's more. Uh, ways of like not defending myself. But getting it over with quicker. Mm. Where with Tyson, you got to stand up and he's going to just swing at you. And one of those is going to land and can be that knockout your whole life. Yeah. Where Same with McGregor, I guess. But I mean, you, you know, you're just going to throw your hands up and try to just, you know, and just take the, I mean, do what Cowboy did. <laughs> you know? I mean, that foot probably would kill me when he kicked him in the face. I, I don't know. You also, I guess, nobody knows how strong they are, too, like how much they can take a hit or a punch or until you really do it. But $20 million is a lot of money. so much money to fight for 40 seconds. It's a lot 40 seconds is an eternity also for someone who never fights. Yes. People don't realize. I think, well, what's his name? What's his name? I got to stop saying what's his name. But uh, uh, the guy that tr- teaches like CrossFit striking um, – probably knows I have, a, I have a crossfit striking story um he was telling us i forget what the average length of like a street fight it's like 10 seconds yeah, it's super short super short and 
every, you know, when I was a little punk kid, I used to get in a lot of fights and I would, it felt like an eternity. You're like, this happened, then this happened, then he rolled on top of me, then he punched me in the head, and then I, you know, blood came out, and then I got off of him, and I kicked him, and and, and it's like... And, and some of that's a factor seconds. of adrenaline. Yeah. You know, adrenaline slows things down, and yeah. people talk about that tunnel vision, and, you know, I'm not a fighter, so I haven't experienced it very many times, but, yeah, it feels like an eternity because everything else sh- is shut off. Yeah. It was, uh, I, I don't know, that, that fight just disappointed me a little bit. <laughs> I was just like, 40 seconds. I, I was on stage. Uh, I was about to go on stage as the fight was about to start. And I was like, one fight before it. And I was like, all right, maybe when I get off, you know, the fight won't have started yet. And I get off stage, they're like, yeah, it's over. And I'm like, yeah, I figured. And they were like, no, I mean, it was like over when it started. <laughs> it was. I, I, I saw a, a great joke, something about... Um, spending four and a half hours in a bar for 30 seconds of enjoyment and women saying this is what we've been doing our whole lives yeah 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 um i think i think people were saying that in the green room after the show uh it was just i i don't want to talk i mean that's why they have what do they have 12 fights or something that day that you go to because because if it was yeah if it was just one Oh my God, I would be so angry. You remember? I don't, I don't know if you were at all a boxing fan, but when Tyson, Tyson came out of prison, that. that first fight out of prison, it was like, like 15 seconds. It was, yeah, it was super short. Everybody yeah. was livid. It's so weird. I watched the fight, or like after the fight in the green room where I met Mike Tyson. He was, uh, I was doing a show in Las Vegas. I, I go do this comedy club, and Mike Tyson had rented out the club uh, for like a six month run. And so he was there every night after me like i would come off stage he'd be in the green room he'd go on stage so i would get to talk to him for a little bit mike tyson was doing comedy oh yeah oh yeah it's one of the greatest things (laughs) why have i never heard about this because this is what every celebrity does when they're broke they either dj or do stand-up comedy we are the least respected uh (laughs) we are the least respected discipline in the arts i mean people just everybody goes oh they watch what we do and they're like, oh, I can do that. I can do that. So, um, yeah, so Tyson was doing it. This is how bad it was. His wife had an, had a microphone in the backstage and he was wearing an IBF. I think it's called an IBF, which is a little thing in his ear. And she would feed him his lines. <laughs> and it was, it was one, the stories are oh. phenomenal. I don't know how true they are. But, like, he's Tyson. Does he have to lie? He doesn't oh, have no. to lie. Yeah. But for some reason, everybody does lie. Uh, his stories were incredible. I mean, like, the amount of money, he said he lost $400 million. He uh, he said they had to bulldoze the house where he kept his tigers. He had two tigers living in a house with no one there. And it was a $10 million house. And they had to just bulldoze the house because the tigers trashed the house. He said the night before, it was either the night or two nights before he fought Buster Douglas. He was out partying with Bobby Brown, and Bobby Brown said to him, Mike, you got to go home. You got to stop partying. You got to go home. You're fighting, because that was like four in the morning. So that was, when Bobby, when Bobby Brown, Brown is telling you, you yeah, that's, you have a problem. that's a sign. Even Tyson has that joke. He goes, <laughs> when, when Bobby Brown's telling you, you got to go home, <laughs> you know you got a problem. Uh, <laughs> who else? He had, um, he just, so many stories about how many STDs he had, how much cocaine he did. Uh, there was a picture of him with, like, cocaine all over his face. And uh, he shows it during the show, and he goes, if I ever catch the motherfucker that took that picture. <laughs> Sounds like something out of Scarface. Yeah. I mean, it looked like it. He had it all over his face. And I don't know. I, I mean, he's just – but again, like, who did I see he's doing stand-up now? Someone else. Uh Who's the chick that had sex with Trump and then snitched on him? Uh, uh, Stormy Daniels. Stormy Daniels. I got in big trouble for fighting with her on Twitter. It's like the worst. I remember that. Yeah. she uh, She's doing stand-up. Jeremy Piven does stand-up now. They all do it. Steve-O. Like, as soon as, like, whatever they're doing's done, they're like, hey, I can make money doing this. And they don't really do stand-up. They tell stories about right. their life. Right. And then they call it stand up or use a stand up comedy club. I wish they would create um, famous people that need to pay their mortgages clubs. 
<laughs> that they would go to. Because I look at comedy like I look at jazz. And it's like, you don't know who any of those jazz musicians are, but they're just fucking good. Yeah. And you don't go there because they're famous. You go there because they're good. And when they're good, it looks easy. Yeah. And I think that that's the, the biggest reason that they're trying to do what you do and what other comedians do is that when you're great at it, it seems effortless. Yeah, I, 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 but I'm not in any way saying I'm great at what I do. I was just having a conversation with Zach Forrest. Zach took me, uh, you know, Zach from yeah. uh, what listeners that don't know, Zach is a former CrossFit Games athlete. He's an L1 instructor, uh, former Navy SEAL. And, He's a badass dude. Yeah, very badass dude. Very strong, very fit fucking and very smart guy. And we went shooting last week in um, Nevada in the desert and – I got to learn from someone who really knows how to shoot and it was amazing like watching him and we started talking about what's going through his mind when he's doing tactical shooting Mm. and it was very comparable and I would say martial arts is probably the same all these things like chess like stand up and that there's such complexity to it that on the surface might look easy but underneath, and I'm not trying to say what I do is hard. It's not like my job's fucking easy. But do you know, I cleaning bedpans out in a nursing home's hard. Uh, but what I was telling him, he was asking me about it. I said, when I'm telling a joke, sometimes I'm thinking, do I enunciate here or do I enunciate here? Do I? What? should I do after this joke? Cause I realized this woman in the crowd looks like she was upset. She might have some reason to do this. And then if I go into that joke, her energy is going to draw away from mm-hmm. that joke. So I'm going to avoid that joke, but how can I segue into this joke? Um, someone coughed. So I need to like pause before the punchline. So that, and maybe re say the setup. Uh, and all these little things are going through my head Oh no, here comes a check. They're going to put a check down at this table. So walk over to this side of the stage so that you don't focus on this attention. And like 50,000 things are going through my head as I'm calculating how to do each thing and choose through my repertoire what joke I'm going to do and what joke I'm not going to do. Or even how do I tell this joke? Like this crowd is like this. So I'm going to make it more relatable like this. This is a really. You know, I don't want to say dumb crowd, but I'm gonna I'm gonna shorten it up, make it a little more so I can. Yeah, you're 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 reading the crowd. You're reading the people that that are in front of you, and I and and I think that's every bit of this. And what I was getting to, Zach was saying the same thing with shooting. He's like, as I'm, you know, loading, I'm going. Well, the wind is this way, and I've got to get here, and there's light coming this way, and um, you know, my my sight's off this much, so I need to drop here, and I need to get in position here and i was like wow i never thought about that and it's it a lot of this stuff just becomes on like a subconscious level yeah after you do it over and over and over and over again so basically what i'm saying is these people like stormy daniels and jeremy piven who are doing it don't really do it (laughs) right right And, and you know it's it's funny that you you say what you do is easy because you've spent so much time developing skill in that nuance and that's something that we talk about in martial arts. It's something you can talk about in shooting. You can talk about with with any any acquired skill. Is that you reach that that stage of that unconscious competence? And in Japanese, it, it's satori. It's the idea that's that called. yeah, the the idea that you've completely shed your awareness because you're so dialed in on what's going on. Mm. And I've had a few moments in sparring, you know, just in practice where. I'm completely gone. Like I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not conscious. Instinct has just taken over. And in doing so, sorry, my instinct just took yeah, over. That yeah, I saw that. We have a very loud crowd. Yeah, they, uh, they took a look over here and decided that it was fine. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm interrupting this amazing episode to talk to you about an amazing product. It's an app called Macro Stacks that I've been using. Uh, to fix my nutrition. I have had so many problems. I was first, I was eating too many carbs. Then I was eating too many fats. And now I'm eating the right amount of protein. Thanks to macro stacks. Um, last night I ate a huge steak. Uh, and then I got up in the morning or two nights ago. Wait. Yeah. 
Last night I had a huge steak. This morning I woke up and I ate a burger for breakfast because I didn't realize how much protein I need. A ton of protein. And it's thanks to Macrostex. It tells me exactly how much, if I want to build muscle, exactly how much protein, carbs, and fat I need. And uh, I was way under eating on the protein. So uh, it's an incredible app. And if you're struggling with your nutrition, check it out. Uh, it's a web app, and it helps you figure out how much to eat, stay on track, reach your goals, and you don't have to think about it at all. It's the best all-in-one app for counting macros. Um, you're going to get a custom plan like I did. You're going to get recipes that fit your exact macros, okay? So you don't have to think about it. You just, boom, it's there. You just make it, and the recipes are delicious, and they're super healthy, and you also have access to a nutrition coach through the app and there's a place to track everything and they've got every kind of food you can imagine i, I mean like something like eight hundred thousand foods and if they don't have it you program it in you plug it in and then it's there so you'll have everything uh what else they've got a uh like i said a wide refi- a wide variety of recipes and it doesn't matter if you're you know, a, a amazing chef or a crappy chef, you can figure it out. They've, they've got them set up for everybody and they, they show you how to make them in bulk to help you with meal prepper to feed a family. So like it'll have a small, you know, portion if you just want to make it for like two of you or if you want to make it, you know, a serving for 20 or whatever. I don't know. Whatever you need, it's there and you want to get 25% off macro stacks. Well, just go to macro stacks.com, enter the code wadcast. All right. Go to macrostacks.com, enter Wadcast. This is not an app. This is a web app. So if you get it on your phone and you want to keep it on your phone, just go to the web page and then you hold down and save it. And it'll save on your home screen. And then it's basically just like an app. Just go straight to that web page every time. So sign up. Get your 25% off at Macrostacks uh, with your subscription. Visit Macrostacks.com, enter the code WADCAST, and get all swole like I am. Hey, guys. Uh, I am a nerd about everything that I put in my body. And one of the things that I've been learning about a lot lately is absorption. And the fact that a lot of the things that you take supplementally do not get absorbed into your gut. Why is that? Because you basically poop them out or the hydrochloric acid in your stomach just destroys it. So if you're taking this stuff and you're spending a lot of money on it, you want to make sure that it's going into your system. There is a product out there called Astrogen, A-S-T-R-A-G-I-N. Look it up, Google it, read any of the clinical, uh, the, the research papers on it, and you will see that Astrogen should be in every product you're taking because it's, uh, it's an absorption ingredient that's going to make sure this stuff gets into you better. It's game changing. It helps support your gut health. Um, the absorption and the bioavailability of key nutrients. Um, it's in hundreds of supplements already, but it needs to be in everything. It's a hundred percent plant based. It was created by the developers at New Live Science. And if you want to help your gut health, uh, everything else works better. And it's the kind of thing you need. Like you, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, how much you want to make sure that this stuff and, and don't take it from me. Just go to Astrogen's website or go to Google and read anything about, uh, about how this stuff works. Um, you might not see it. In your product that you're taking. And if you don't, send a little message, send an email, send a tweet, send a Instagram to the company of your favorite supplement and say, Hey, why aren't you using estrogen? I understand this stuff gets it into my system better. And why shouldn't I? So it's ideal for people of all walks of life, whether you're a weekend warrior, you know, you're just like, I don't know, you, you just go to CrossFit once or twice a week, or you're a crazy, crazy competitor. You need this show. Shush stuff. Shush, shush, shush. I almost swore during an ad. Who cares? I care. Uh, and you can find estrogen in a wide variety of supplements. So make sure your supplement has estrogen in the formula. Uh, how about this? Um, 
you can't get it anywhere. You're not going to be able to order it yourself. You just have to make sure it's in what you get. Okay. Got it. Got it. That's Astrogen. A-S-T-R-A-G-I-N. Oh, this is a perfect place for them to do their selfie photos. I'm just, I feel like if I stare at them, yeah. they'll get the idea that I've maybe, got a feeling they're going to leave soon. I'm hoping. I mean, it's, we are in a public place, so it's it's our fault. My, my point of bringing up Satori, and this is this is something that, that I'm guessing, because I don't do what you do, but when you're on stage, when, you, when you're able to disconnect the conscious element from it, okay. things happen so much faster. If you, if you throw a punch at me or, you know, I'm on stage and I'm watching someone, you know, doing something in the crowd, I can't react to that quickly enough that you're not going to know. But you've spent enough time on stage. I've spent enough time, you know, working with other martial artists that I can handle those, you know, dozen things that are happening all at once and move outside of it. And in any skill if you develop it far enough there's that much nuance i mean there's that much nuance in crossfit competition there's that much nuance in i mean any team sport there's so much going on well i watched um some like basic how-to videos and like because uh one of the guests on here was like you got to come to jujitsu with me and i was like oh god i kind of want to learn i just don't want to roll around all the time and i was like looking online at at like basic jiu-jitsu moves and i was like wow this is so complex and to have it be um innate is like that it's just what you your go-to like your it's just your natural I, I, to me i'm like oh my god this would just take so lo-, and that's intimidating of how there's a lot of nuance take. Yeah. there's a lot of nuance i mean and and there's nuance in in everything i mean we can, we can take what's the most basic movement you would think of in context of martial arts be a punch, right? I can, I can teach you in, in 30 seconds how to, you know, roll your fist up and, and punch properly such that, you know, if you punch that wall or somebody in a jaw, you're unlikely to break your hand. But the skill and the experience to throw that punch at the right time to the right target, working with the right person, you know, that, that takes years. Yeah. To develop, and you know, you can say that you master it, but well, know, I'm, it's just experience. I'm. Uh, I want to take you know my kids. My daughter's five. My son's a blob, <laughs> and uh, I want them to learn, and I want them to you know go to jujitsu. And I'm just like, at what age? What age do you think is good to start kids? And okay, keep. I'm gonna have. To. So Eddie's going over to talk to these these strangers. There. Oh, well, fortunately they were receptive. We don't have to fight them. I was worried. So I wasn't sure what version of you we were going to get going over there. No, I, I mean I'm, we're in a public <laughs> place, so it's not. It's uh, they're not doing anything wrong. Um. So. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of value. I mean, obviously, I started martial arts real young, and and you know I can't speak to teaching BJJ to young kids. You know, I, I, I don't know how that works. I can speak to teaching striking arts, karate, taekwondo to young kids. And for most of them, um, most kids are ready around five or six. Okay. Some schools will operate classes for much younger children, you know, three, four. Wow. But it depends on the kid. Is that just to keep your kids out of the house and run them down? It, it's, some schools run it as like a babysitting class. Yeah. Other schools look at it as we're setting the expectation. We're trying to build the relationship with the instructor and we're trying to show what that structure of a class might look like so that when they do stick around, when they show up at five, six years old, we can get that much more work done with them and we can actually help them progress and teach them some real skill. Okay, so uh, is it like a language? Like if a kid learns it, my daughter's learning Spanish right now and she just picks it up. A thousand times faster than yeah, I did. It, it's, it's the same thing. It's a language, but at the same time, because I mean, the the, the mind body connection is is still forming up until the teens, mm-hmm. and and I've read some things that say you know up until twenty five. Wow, it's still forming, and the idea that 
you're going to watch something and be able to mimic, okay, so that person's doing this thing with their left hand and then their right foot and, you know, this big kind of combat game of Twister. Sometimes it's really hard to replicate that when you're seven years old and your brain just, you know, it's mush. It doesn't work in the same way that ours does as an adult. And a lot of instructors don't want to work with that. And some don't understand that. It can be really frustrating. You know, you take a kid and, and, show them some really fundamental stuff and they just they just can't connect those dots right because they're not able to yet and that's okay what did you do before crossfit for your uh conditioning for martial arts i was a standard gym bum yeah. you know three sets of 10 on everything kind of a thing like i'm doing right now <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's really but there's some value there right and the, the what i'm doing is and and people can be critical of me but it's just like i i think crossfit's amazing and i will be crossfitting again i just need to take some time off my knees mm-hmm. and i can't be under a lot of weight uh so um, I'm doing the bodybuilding stuff. I also need to gain size, right? mass, because as I get older, I need more muscle mass. Right. We all do. CrossFit's, you can do it if you're eating a lot, but it's just easier right now to do this, to build up my muscle, because I have some endurance events coming up that I'm going to be doing, and I'll shed a lot of weight. So uh, I'd rather like build up a lot and then come down halfway. Right. But this is where CrossFit's going, right? I mean, you, you look at... The programming that's coming up. What's what's Camille doing? What's Marcus Philly doing? What's um, Marcus Philly does the functional bodybuilding. Yeah, uh, yeah. Raw's got Bobby D's got yeah. his thing, right? There's a lot of that CrossFit bodybuilding hybrid that's going on, and I, I really think that's the future of CrossFit. Not for the sport of CrossFit, but for the well, class style of CrossFit. No matter what anybody says, and they will all deny it, but aesthetics is so important. Yes, in in this world like people want to look good and crossfitters look like they're in good shape but there's an easier way to get to real like looking good yes yeah and and, and the perfect example is i've had on celebrity trainers on the guys that get the hollywood guys they do it in six weeks they get these guys in shape now there's it's so funny if you look at uh what's his name camille nanjani look up camille who's on silicon valley okay He's he's playing a character in a, in one of the Marvel movies, and they had to get him in shape over oh uh, yes over a year. Yes. I think they had a year. But if you look at him, I mean, he looks like he's going to an amateur bodybuilding competition. There's been a lot of speculation about whether he's uh, enhanced or not. I think he's probably pretty natural. Um, he just doesn't seem like the kind of guy that would do. He's too nerdy to do any kind of injections or anything. But um, he he looks. Insane, and a lot of celebrities do yeah. use performance enhancing drugs. He looks ridiculous, and they did it just by dying. Now, also, if you saw him stand next to, say, Matt Frazier, even though Matt's pretty short, Camille's not going to look like Matt Frazier. Right. You're going to see a vast, vast difference, and it's he's going to look like a puny little skinny wimp. Right, because to Matt. Cause of the timing, he I mean, doesn't have the time. He looks ripped. But that's because he's up against no one right. in the picture. Put him up standing next to, you know, put him in the gym next to those guys. Right. And you're going to go, oh, wow. Holy shit. He's tiny. Yeah. Um, so everybody's trying to get that good build. And CrossFit, you know, like CrossFit gets you fit. It does. And they say, oh, aesthetics come along with it. And you look at someone like Froning, who's built like perfectly. But Froning did a lot of extra shit and and i would argue that i mean all those guys that look that way are doing extra stuff that their strength prioritized and that the the metcons are supplemental i mean we, yes we, we've yeah. we've heard from a, a number of high level competitors that say they spend you know primarily eight nine months out of the year building strength and then those last few months before competition that's when they're yeah. ramping up the cardio because crossfit the way and 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 You'll probably end up getting the hate out of this and not me, and that's fine, but I'll take it because I have no problem with that. Most gyms, the way they program CrossFit, it's a cardio adaptation. Sure. You cannot build cardio fitness and strength at the same time. Everything I've read says that it's one or the other. Yeah, there will be people that will argue that, but but I, I kind of agree with that. Um, 
And you look at people at most CrossFit gyms. How long have you been coming here? Oh, three years. And I, and I see this, you know, at, at gyms that I, I work out at. You get people who've been there for years and they're diligent and they work hard and they lose muscle. Yeah. Well, that's why I just decided if I want to maintain where I'm at, I can continue to do this. But if I need, like, you know, I want to do the Ironman and I want to do, uh, I'm talking about climbing Mount Whitney and I'm doing a couple other things. If I want to do these things and not shrivel away to nothing, right. I need to build up. So I'm eating tons and tons. I'm using this app that I advertise for called Macro Stacks, and it's just telling me you're not eating enough protein. You're not eating enough protein. You're not eating. And I mean, that's how much I'm, is it telling you to get? Two hundred. Two hundred grams. Two even over two hundred grams. Wow. Yeah. And you know how hard it is to get two hundred grams of protein a, a day. It's a lot. My um, my father in law, who's the former NFL football player, just came back from UNC. Just did a big big test on him because of the CT or um. CTE. Yeah. They did a huge test on him, like a three day test. And, uh, he doesn't have advanced stages of it, which is great. Like he has, you know, signs of it, like they all do, but his isn't progressing. And they're trying to figure out, you know, cause they're figuring this out. They're trying to, I probably shouldn't be talking about this, but they're trying to figure out why his is not. And I think it's a number of things. He eats incredibly. He, not incredibly, he eats well. He supplements very, very well. Yeah. I mean, it's the business he's in. He uh, exercises a lot, and he uh, he's active, like mentally. He's yeah. very, very active, and I swear there's something to that. Like he exercises. Oh, for brain. sure. And um, but they said the same thing to him. They want him getting over 200 grams of protein a day. Yeah. It's so funny because everybody talks about keto getting your fats or no carb or no. Nobody talks about protein and like. Where's muscle coming from? Uh, Bobby and Hunter are so on this like amino acid trip of like taking perfect aminos. And a lot of the nutritionists I talk to are like, yeah, well, if you can't get it from your food. And it's like, you can't. It's hard. It's hard to eat that many. It's, you know? it's really hard. Um, have you heard Wellborn's story about CTE and how he reversed his? You might want to look at look into that. He's he's been he was pretty open about it years ago on on his show. About how he, he was talking about how, and, and my apologies if I'm misremembering some of this, but he would call somebody and then five minutes later call them and have the same phone call again. You know, his brain was that bad. Whoa. And so was, somebody kind of intervened and he basically went keto for two years, like really strict medical grade. I believe he was under supervision yeah. and his before and afters showed that he reversed it all. So I, I'd be curious to see that because uh, uh, Dylan, who's on the show here, Physiologic, uh, who does the show a lot, uh, Dylan Farr, he was a pro snowboarder and has many, many, many concussions, has had all kinds of screwed up things happen from it. And he's, uh, he, I mean, that's pretty much what he adheres to. He wouldn't say it's a keto diet. He'd say it's a nutrient dense diet. Um, yeah. but, but there's very little carbohydrates other than cruciferous vegetables and right. certain things. I mean, he experiments with everything. He's hardcore, but I just had a friend get, people don't realize how bad just a concussion can be. Yeah. Like, um, when you're damaging your brain, it's like, think about like tearing your hamstring or breaking your ankle. When you get a concussion, you're damaging your brain. Right. And everybody thinks like, ah, oh, cause we've all had them or had a few of them. I've had a whole bunch. I, but can't I, tell you how many I've probably I, had on, yeah, on a I, low level. Yeah, but I just don't like attribute. I don't put myself in the category because I'm like, well, I never. I mean, I did play football, but never at that level. I did do this, but never at that level. So but that doesn't make a difference. Like it, they all add up. Yeah, your brain doesn't care what you were doing when you got when you got the concussion. And uh, so I don't know how much damage I've done. Um, my buddy just got one surfing. He was in that Jaws competition and. You know, a forty foot wave came down on his head, and he's all fucked up from it. So, uh, it's you know, I've heard that about surfers. They say when they get ragdolled under the water, they're all getting concussed. Yeah, yeah, and and the evidence, you know, and and I'm not a researcher. You know, I just yeah, I I look, I read, and everything says that you know carbs right after that are the worst thing. So you know, if I if I'm coaching, I mean, we, you know, whether I'm coaching martial arts or CrossFit or anything like that, when somebody bangs their head. You know, hey, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nutritionist. Don't listen to me. But watch the carbohydrates for a few days. It just seems like if you're not going to burn glycogen, like burn it up, 
you shouldn't have it. Like I, I try to stay away from it as much as possible. When I did my long run, I, I did it the whole time because I was like, I'm burning this. This is my fuel. Right. It's the easiest thing to process. But if I'm not going to burn it, it shouldn't be in me. And more and more, I'm seeing that with everything. And I don't consider vegetables like we, I don't put that in the same category because there's so little calories in them and nobody ever got fat eating vegetables. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, except for corn, <laughs> corn will make you fat as fuck. <laughs> corn or corn syrup? Have you been to Mexico? <laughs> There's um. Do you watch Hasan Minaj's show on Netflix? A little bit, not really. There was an episode where they're talking about high fructose corn syrup, and basically you can correlate the introduction of corn syrup to obesity. Yeah. Every country it's gone yeah. to. Yeah. You know, and then they were talking about Mexico a lot because it was like 50 years ago, Mexico was like the picture of health. Yeah. And then we were like, oh, how is this? Instead of that Coke with the sugar in it, let's put some. Uh, Try this. HFCS in there. And uh, uh, it's the worst thing in the world. Yeah. But if, if we could just stay away from that, I mean, it's everything. It's, it's so funny because as soon as I start talking about it, it's like people think I'm dogmatic and they start to get upset with me. So I have to shut up. But I'm like, I tell people that are on the same page as me it's like we're the living living among the zombies yeah and the zombies you can't talk to them they don't want to hear it and you're like zombies we can save you we can bring you back to the living but you got to get away from that that shit is and and i'm guilty too i'm being a hypocrite because you know if you put it around me i eat it and once I start eating, I can't stop. But at least you're making the choice. You're making a choice based on the knowledge that you have. And and I'd also like to see it, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, such a, I'm not a Democrat or Republican, but I don't believe in so much regulation. I'm like, we, you can't make this stuff and you can't make, but I just think we've got all these huge healthcare problems. We can't afford to pay the healthcare in America. This is why we can't afford that's the one thing. Whenever all these Democrats that are talking about single payer and blah blah blah, it's like you're all liars because we can't afford it. We right. can't, as a country, pay for it because of our obesity epidemic and the diabetes and the all the health problems. The take, heart- if you if you really want to trip out, if you want to nerd out on this, take a look at the corn subsidies. Oh, it's ridiculous! That, and, and how much those subsidies end up costing down the line in healthcare. The, well, not only the healthcare problems, our immigration problems are due to corn subsidies. No one talks about this ever. Lawrence Lessig did uh, in his book uh, *Republic Lost*, which I love. And um, but what happens is when people talk about oh, we, you know, these immigrants and build this wall and everything, that's great and everything, but it's a little more complex than you think it is. We uh, Mexico used to grow corn. And that was where they made all their money. They farmed corn. Well, we subsidized the corn industry in America so we can make corn for next to nothing and sell it for next to nothing. And these corporate farms don't need our subsidies, but they lobby to get them because why not? If you're going to get all this free money, money, free money. So they get the money. And so then they sell the corn at such a cheap price that it put all the Mexican farms out of business. So all these people that are trained farmers, that's what they do for a living. Where are they going to go get work? Well, we're prospering in America, so they come here to get jobs. So it's just such a complex issue that building a wall is not the answer. And anyone that, you know, you can't argue with the people that want to build it. Um, They're like, oh, you're for open borders. No, no, I'm for pragmatism. I'm for finding a solution to a problem and not trying to do something symbolic because you Dumb people like you only react to that. Anytime someone says, all you have to do is, I tune out. Because there is no problem on the planet that is that simple to solve. Otherwise, it would have been solved. Yeah, well, uh, it's just, I'm, I'm so frustrated with it because it's just, it <laughs> never ceases to amaze me how dumb the, the American, I don't want to say the American people are too because of the world. But just the masses are fucking stupid. I mean, stupid. The fact that you have to, you have to placate them with this like dumb shit that this one's just laughing at us talking. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, we're kind of ridiculous. I mean, we're sitting in the lobby of a hotel with microphones. Yeah, I know. I, I'm so used to it. It's such a part of my life. I've For the last 25 years of my life, everywhere I go, there's cameras or microphones. And I remember how it was like fun when I was younger. And I was like, look at me. And now I'm just like, right. it's just it's second just of, nature. Yeah. I filmed something this week in San Diego. Uh, I'm working on this project for Surfer Magazine. And we had two jet skis, cameramen on the jet skis. I'm getting towed into waves. And there's like cameramen all around me. And I'm like, and in a moment, I just thought to myself, if I was just a dude surfing out here and I saw this, I'd be like, what is who that? is that asshole right there? Right. <laughs> and I'm like, who's that guy stealing my wave? Yeah. And that's what I was thinking. And I'm like, I'm that asshole. I'm that guy. And it's just been my whole life. <laughs> I mean, you've been that asshole your whole life. Yeah. For more than half my <laughs> life, I have been that asshole that it, I knew about it in the beginning. Now it doesn't even phase me. I'm just like, oh, this is what, this is an extension of my life. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you started your podcast. How long ago? Five years. Five years. That's a little bit after, uh, I think we were about eight years old. Yeah, the, you started the show. So funny story about that. So I, I found the show, must have been 2012, spring to summer 2012. Yeah. And, you know, you were on like episode 12 or something like that. <laughs> and right about episode 20, I drove from Vermont to New Jersey for my L1. And so what did I listen to? I was like, I listen to all the back episodes of the podcast, uh-huh. and and I remember even tweeting you guys, me like, if I fail my L one, it's your fault. <laughs> Nobody's ever failed an L one. <laughs> I almost did. I almost <laughs> did. I was like two questions off. Um, yeah, but I keep it, saying I should go just for I, fun, just for shits. And I, giggles, I don't I think anyone in the room L1. would would enjoy you being there. I can't see you <laughs> staying quiet. <laughs> They start talking about handstand push-ups. You lose your uh, mind. I, I, I would. I would declare war. I, it's funny. I, But I agree with you. It's I, the one movement that needs to come out of CrossFit. I was talking to Dave Castro today, and I'm going to interview Dave. And uh, I was looking on his Instagram, and he was talking about how bad he is at handstand push-ups, and he hates them. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, you're, get rid of them. You program them. Get rid of them. I just will never understand it. And you know, it's a gymnastic movement. Yes, yeah, so is a triple backflip, but no one's doing that. It's a gymnastic movement when they're doing a couple of them. Yeah. Strict. They're not putting ab mats under their head and bouncing off the floor, oh, kipping, handstand. It just, yeah. I don't think anybody hates it as much as I do. I, it's, it's funny. Since I declared war on it, I just won't do it. I will not, will not ever do it. I do them once in a great while just to I was good at them, remind though. everyone that I can. I was real. They, of like all the things I've done, it was one of the things I actually was good at. You know, deadlifting and handstand push-ups. So Diane was like my specialty. Right. But I just, my... Every time someone says to you, I have a bad back and you're like, oh, really? Or I have a slip disc or a herniated disc or whatever it is, neck, thoracic, cervical, lumbar. Aren't you like you just go, oh, yeah, let's, let's you, bang you on the top of the head with more than your body weight. And you're just like, oh, your life sucks right now. <laughs> Why would you yeah. want to risk that? at all it's not worth it it's not and and this is one of the things that i try to get people to realize when i'm coaching it's you're not going to the games <laughs> i mean we, we all know that you're not going to the games and it's fun to train in that way with that intensity sure. you know for any of us who, who competed it's something you know to 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 have that fire right yeah. it's it's addictive yeah. but who was it you had somebody on the show that said how do you where do you want to be when you're 80, 90 yeah. and reverse engineer from that? Yeah. James Fitzgerald. Yeah. And, and I just thought that was such a great way to put it because it is what we need to do. Yeah. You know, it, our handstand pushups going to serve you getting to 80, 90 years old and being active. No, but damn near everything else in CrossFit will. Yeah. And Pat Barber and I had this argument and he truly believes that if you do CrossFit and you do it right, it's going to get you there. I disagreed with him. What's the definition of right? Pat just thinks when I was talking to him about 
uh, different things like lateral movement or I said my I have a huge argument that we don't do enough extensor work um, uh, with our forearms like you know we're doing flexor nothing extensor and he goes what are push-ups he goes we do tons of push-ups that's extensor work and I was like yeah I don't feel like you do anything unless you're you know reversing your hands and doing push-ups but um, he's like that's extensor work and I said look you talk to any CrossFitter, any CrossFitter, from soccer mom to competitor, and they've got elbow issues. Everybody's yep. got elbow issues because yep. there's way, way too much, you know, gripping. That everything involves gripping. So, if you are functional and you are talking about, well, this is for health, then you better start programming in something that is going to help your extensors and and fix that muscular imbalance exactly and, it, and what it comes down to for everybody is that imbalance i mean how many how many male crossfitters have shoulder issues yeah right huge number of us because yeah. we have you know we have internally rotated, rotated shoulders and and you know if you're not doing your crossover symmetry or whatever I think, I think that's that's one i think people have become so aware of and are fixing and but it uh, took years yeah it was years of every everybody walking around going why do my shoulders hurt all the time there was there was definitely an evolution of that and um i don't think glassman prepared for that in the beginning but probably everyone else caught on to it and was like let's let's add this let's add that i just would like to see the elbow issue fixed um i mean i i I bet if I polled, if I went on Facebook and our Facebook group and I said, how many of you experienced, uh, who hasn't experienced elbow issues, uh, any kind of tendonitis in your elbows? And I, I think 90% would say they sure. have. Sure. And I think a huge part of that too is people step into CrossFit and there's no requirement in most gyms before you start kipping. And the dynamic load on the joints mm -hmm. through kipping pull-ups and, and all these kipping movements. If you look at gymnastics, if you look at youth gymnastics, and I, I coached gymnastics for a little while, the first years, three, four, five years of a little kid getting into gymnastics, it's all strict movement conditioning mm -hmm. because they're trying to strengthen up the connective tissue so they can handle these massive force loads. I, I forget what the force multiplier is on a giant, you know, a full revolution on a bar but it's it's multiple times your body weight yeah yeah it's it's huge and oh, no a kipping pull-up isn't that strong of a force but it's still more than body weight when you come down and you kick back up you taught gymnastics is there anything you haven't done i've done a lot of things i enjoy movement yeah i enjoy movement so do i, I just realized recently that uh i'm really into um for a while, I lost focus, and I got into CrossFit, and I'm now into using my CrossFit. Like, and I really do believe, like, yesterday, or yesterday, I was, it was yesterday, no, two days ago, I was out in the middle of the ocean being towed into waves for this project, and I don't think I could have done it if I hadn't done CrossFit. Mm. Because the one thing, you know, it's like you're, it's like wakeboarding, being picked up and, you know, this is like strong force to pull you out of the water and, you know, pa practically rips the thing out of your hands. Yes. And so I started using my hook grip <laughs> and I said to uh, uh, Ryan Hargrave, who's the big wave surfing rescue guy who trains all the guys. I was like, hey, do you guys do the hook grip when you he's like, huh? And I'm like, have they even considered that? No. And I was like, oh, interesting. you know, weightlifters when they and he was like, huh, that's interesting. And I started doing it. I'm like. Oh my God, this works so much better. You know, I've got such a better hold. And, um, but, you know, the next day I woke up and my shoulders and my back and my forearms, my forearms are just fried. Like I've been doing curls for, for, <laughs> you know, like that, you know, that curl workout where you can't sleep, where right. you, you hold your arms up. Uh, that's what I feel like. Uh, but there was so much like core involved, like when I was sitting in the ocean just trying to like, keep the board steady when they were going to pick me up. I was like, oh, this is all ab stuff. And I just can't imagine just being some average Joe surfer that doesn't do this kind of conditioning work and being able to do it. Yeah. Um, so I like using my CrossFit. I like going mountain biking and skiing and surfing and um, 
I was skiing with a bunch of guys recently in Tahoe and we went all the way out of bounds and they were like, Hey, where'd you get this? You know, they're all like intense skiers and do this all that. They're like, where'd you get this cardio? And I'm like, CrossFit, give it a try. You know, like, yeah. you know, and, it's yeah. all movement. Yeah. It's all movement. It's all movement done in different ways. There are only so many ways the body can move. Yeah. You know, and, and you use different movements in different ways. I mean, I can, I can punch someone in the face and that's, very similar to an overhand stroke, mm-hmm. you know, swimming. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all the same stuff. So you, you get enough of a, a foundation, whether it's through martial arts, it's through CrossFit, it's through gymnastics, and you start looking at the next thing, and it's not that different. It's not like you're completely starting over. You have reference points. And so when I learned CrossFit, I was like, oh, okay. You know, I'm referring back to my physical knowledge mm-hmm. from martial arts and, you know, parkour and, and all the other things that I've done. They all do tie together a lot in, um, you know, all the athletic movements and everything. So any kind of base you have. And I think, you know, I've said it a million times and we should be teaching them. To, I, as again, I'm not a Kool-Aid drinker, but I think CrossFit should be taught in schools. I think it's, it's should be added to physical fitness and you teach it as a way of strength training, training and conditioning. And I just, any school that's doing it. I get messages all the time. Our school does it or we've instituted it or this or that. And I'm not saying as intense as, you know, Tia Claire Toomey's doing it. I'm saying on a basic level to teach it in schools, you're just going to make a more well-rounded athlete and somebody who can handle, you know, life and functional to, to be functional. Um, I do think, uh, as I hear the, the Chinese whispers uh, that the they've kind of – I feel like CrossFit's a lot dropped the ball though. I really, really do. And I'm worried that we're in this like weird time and there's uh, – shit's going to go down. What, kind of, what do you mean by shit's going to go down? What kind of – This is an Good. interesting subject that I'm going to bring up that I might regret. Oh, I'm, bringing I'm pumped. Up. Bring it on. How old's Greg Glassman? 50s? I don't, no, I don't. way older than that. Is he? Yeah, he's in his 60s. And, you know, he's getting towards the, you know, he's, he's definitely on the back nine. And uh, let's say 10, 20, 30 years, what, you know, what he could have left in him. What happens when someday Greg Glassman passes away? What happens? Who takes over? Where does this go? Who is running it? Who is in charge? How does it continue? Uh, who owns it? Uh, Do you really think Greg is driving yes. CrossFit overall Absol- now? As, as an Absolute. organization, yes. But what about absolutely? If so, I, I'm so, gonna- so here's here's my theory. I'm going to get to it. So Greg was driving it with a bunch of disciples. He had a whole bunch of disciples, and they all were the guys that started it. You know, you look at the guys who were at the first certs, the guys right. who started the first affiliates, the guys that were the first, the OGs of the games. Well, as they kind of matured, most of them have gone off to do their own kind of thing. Yes. Because, and I'm not, I okay, maybe I am being critical. I don't know. You know, I'm just, this is just from a, you know, outsider standpoint. They obviously left because they weren't being taken care of as well as they could have been. You know, if you pay people well or, uh, you know, they don't want to leave. They want to stay and be part of it. But obviously all these people, and I'm not naming names, but I mean, it's pretty obvious that a lot of the big names have gone off to create their own kind of hybridization of it. Yes. Okay, so... They're now no longer part of it. They've used what they learned from it, went off and created a bastardized version of it. So they're no longer in part of the mothership. And that's the, to me, that's the difference between CrossFit Inc. and CrossFit the movement. Right. And I'm sure some of them left because of you know money or not being taken care of. But I think also... When I, when I look at the people who were there in the early days, they were creating something. And you can't, in, in my observation, if you have really solid creators, you have to give them an opportunity to create their own thing. 
you know, they're they're not going to thrive okay, under so, someone so else's. Let's, so let's look at this. CrossFit for kids, CrossFit striking, CrossFit football, CrossFit endurance. Where did those all go? They went off to do their own thing. Right. Because they got squashed under CrossFit. Yes. Well, so now you've lost your disciples. But the methodology is still there. It's the just... methodology is there, but there's nothing to... What I'm saying is in the future, what is going to propel the methodology further? It's already out there. I don't, I don't think you... I don't think you can close Pandora's box. No, and I think- but, but, but you, you can because it was – CrossFit was nothing that hadn't been done before. People have been doing strength and conditioning forever. And right. He, he tied together all these aspects and created it under the, under the umbrella of CrossFit. Well, the umbrella of CrossFit at some point, how does it continue? I don't think it needs to. And and this is and so this is a conversation that I've had with people. I think CrossFit's biggest contribution to the world is not CrossFit. It's bringing people it, to it it brought people together in a way that they were willing to ask questions about everything that we thought we knew around strength, conditioning, health, nutrition, fitness, whatever you want to call it. And show me another 10, 15 year period in time when we have had this I, much I, progress. I, I, I don't want to take anything away from what it's done or it's created a fitness revolution. What I'm saying is as it's bastardized and you, I don't, I could be crazy, but I don't think that CrossFit will continue long after the, the methodology will be taken and used in many different places, but CrossFit as like HQ overseeing everything. Right. I don't see it as lasting much longer after Greg Glass. No, oh, I agree. And I don't even, I, I'm going to guess that it will fade. Not completely. It won't go out of business, but show me any other, industry that has spiked that hard that hasn't had a correction apple apple's not an industry apple's a, a business but like look look at curves right curves was like straight up and then they kind of plotted along for a couple of years and then they tanked right jazzer size anything like that any fitness business uh orange theory you know right. their their day of reckoning is coming as well but the difference is that crossfit was more than just going to crossfit gyms that the- right i mean he created a revolution absolutely I really do believe that no one was using kettlebells nobody was nobody was olympic weightlifting he he brought that into the the common person's lexicon it was you know i was just at a crunch fitness you know and they're like and this is our functional fitness area functional fitness is going to be around forever right crossfit may not right and that's and that's okay but it no but it could if the disciples were taken care of better see just the 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 smile on your face tells me you probably know things that i don't know i don't know because you know people that i I have talked a lot of people i just think that You know, I heard they all, I know, I know nothing. I heard they were all paid extremely well for a long time. I heard that about like any of those guys that worked in CrossFit media or whatever, were all taken care of really, really well. Um, and that's why they all were so militantly loyal to it. Their, that loyalty no longer exists, I don't believe. Because you know, when you fire somebody, right. they're not loyal to no. you. I mean, they still might see you as the, the hand that feeds them, so they're not going to bite it. But you know, if there's still a chance of getting something from you, they're not going to, you know, but they're not loyal to you like they, like they were. The loyalty in CrossFit was scary. 
I mean, they were like, you know, I felt like you yeah. were on the Death Star. Yeah. And you, you know what? I, I, I think there's a moment when that changed and that's when um, whichever one of the Russells got axed from that uh yeah the, that issue there yeah, that the, the the gay issue yeah um like the gay issue it sounds like i sound like i let you say it i wasn't gonna no, say it i though. sound like <laughs> i sound like a gay a, the gay i mean he he made some comments he said things. some horrible things yeah so um i just think and people get mad at me for doing this i'm doing it again Episode one, I think I mentioned it. I go, it's going to bastardize. Mm-hmm. Eventually, no one's going to need it because everybody's going to know it. Right. right. And, and you see gyms de-affiliating. Yeah. And I'm watching some of the gyms up in our area that are, n- even though they are affiliates, they're not using the word CrossFit in their social media. Yep. That they, they're preparing for Look, that, that that's, a, that's a dirty little secret that no one wants to talk about. And I'll say it. Everyone I talk to, it's a conversation when somebody's opening a gym or whatever they're doing with their gym. The first question is, are you affiliating? And then there's so much talk of not affiliating. And what do we get from affiliating? What don't we get from it? Uh, is it worth this money? Is it not worth? I mean, the whole scheme of things is $3,000 that much money. I mean, like, shouldn't you affiliate? But apparently it is that much money to them because a lot of gyms are not. And I'm sure you're going to hear stats from CrossFit that say, oh, yeah, we've got, you know, we're 10% more affiliates than we've ever had this year. Right. And that's international growth. I mean, you're. No, I mean, no business is going to tell you. They're not going to to come out and say that they're not doing well. Yeah, they're never. They don't. They don't have shareholders. They don't have to tell the. So they can they can tell you anything they want to tell you. But the just from my experience. Go on like – I used to go on Google Maps. Whenever I get to a city, I Google Maps uh, and look for CrossFit gyms, which is the closest one to me. That's right. the one I'm going to. And it used to be like 10, 20 of them. You know? Now you Google it and some of them will show up, but it will say so-and-so performance and right. uh, so-and-so strength and conditioning. And they obviously still have an affiliate then, but they no longer have it in their name. Now, why would people be changing their names? It's marketing in some way. Why? What I think you want me to say is because the general public feels that there's a negative association yeah. with CrossFit around injury and, and whatnot. And, and I don't, I think that that's probably true for some of them. My suspicion is that some of them are watching what is going on and the political push, you know, cross, I mean, we, CrossFit going after the NSCA, CrossFit going after Coca-Cola and, and, and all these things that are happening. If I was an affiliate owner, that would make me nervous. Sure. I affiliated to open a gym, not to be associated with, you know, a political group lobbying, you know, some very powerful corporations. And what's the blowback like on that? I don't know. What's the safest thing for me to do? I'm going to affiliate, but I'm going to be really quiet about my association. So... There's these, a splashback. Uh, I'm getting too into it because I do know a lot of inside information. But these next couple of years are just going to be very, very weird with what's going on with Reebok, what's going on with the games. Um, it, look, it, everything's evolving, and I, you know, I talk because it's content, um, and it's usually like I put stuff out there that is uh, stuff that I have stuff that I've heard that I probably shouldn't talk about, but. Who gives a fuck? That's the best stuff to talk about. I know, I know, I know. But I feel like it's so funny when I go to a gym and I meet someone who is a listener to the show. They just start talking. I'm like, fuck, I forgot I put that out there. (laughs) I I don't know if I should have. I don't know if I should have released that information. Sometimes, uh, I don't know. I I can't imagine being so big as uh, – it's going to be interesting meeting Dave Castro and if he's ever listened to the show and goes, yeah. oh, you're the guy that said this. I can't remember how many probably things I've said that he'll go like, – I'm. I don't know. He might punch me in the face and I'll be like, what was that for? And he'll be like, you said, you said, you said. I, like, you've probably said a few things about him that weren't punching in the face. And I'm like, I don't remember that one. You know, so you know when you do this stuff and you do it every week for – you start – you start forgetting. It gets blurry. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. get that. I totally get that. And um, 
and you know your positions change it's it's like all these uh uh the guys in the 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 political pundits you watch them and you're like they're just talking to talk mm-hmm. it's their job and they're just they got to fill time sh- yeah and they're just making shit out of and they're finding stuff and they might say some people go but you said this 2 weeks ago and the guy's like I'm, that's why I don't ever take those guys seriously because they are just trying to be entertaining and keep you watching to 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 push you into that ad. It's, yes. And so basically I'm saying stop listening to the Wadcast podcast because all I'm trying to do is push <laughs> you into the next ad. So this ad is brought to you by <laughs> – try. Um, so how much fitter are you than uh, – than all the other uh, martial artists, you know, thanks to CrossFit. Uh, most. Yeah? Yeah. It's um, the biggest change that happened from CrossFit is that, so in the martial the traditional martial arts world, testing time, you know, testing for your next rank or whatever is a big deal. And it's mm-hmm. something that a lot of people will prepare for. And these tests, depending on the school, depending on the rank, could be anywhere from an hour up to some schools run multi-day or even week-long black belt, you know, high rank tests. And it's not just showing competency, it's showing strength and conditioning and everything because in a lot of schools, the idea that you can adequately defend yourself is an important piece. Sorry. Is your battery dying? No, it just went dark. Okay. Once I started doing CrossFit, I no longer had to prepare for the strength and conditioning part. Right. I didn't have to go out and, you know, log miles or hop in the gym or whatever else to prepare. I could spend my time preparing on technique. I could spend my time working on my forms and the other things that, you know, I wasn't doing multiple times per week. With your experience, have you seen, I feel that all these OGs of CrossFit that I'm talking to are all moving into BJJ. A lot of them are doing Brazilian. It's, it's the, it's the adult male nerd physical chess. It's, there's something about, there's this like bro culture that I, yes, I just talked about this recently. All these guys I know do, do CrossFit. They do jujitsu, they surf and they mountain bike. It's like, it's like that's what they do on a regular basis. It's, you know, it's like the football, baseball, basketball. Right. Everybody used to do football, baseball, basketball. Now it's CrossFit, jujitsu, surfing, and mountain biking. Yep. And I'm guilty of it. I don't, you know, like it, I always BMX biked when I was a kid. So I, mountain biking was a natural progression. I surfed, you know, got into surfing, always around the water. But like I'm not into jujitsu. I got into CrossFit, but now I feel like I'm going towards it. Like, I just have to learn it because it's a part of being a man. You, you don't have to. I think everybody should have some kind of something's drawn me physical towards. discipline. You know, physical. Uh, let's say combative discipline, right? Because I think that gives you confidence. So, in martial arts, one of the things I am most proud of is the fact I've never been in what I would call a real fight. Wow! Not because you don't have. I'm to. afraid to, you don't or have I'm scared to, to but because. My ego is such that I have nothing to prove to anyone. Let me ask you this, though. When I have been in real fights, the adrenaline goes through the roof. Yes. It's, the fight or flight is ridiculous. It's like nothing you ever experience. Um, and it's not good. Like, it's, it's not a fun feeling. It's a, it's no. a, and when it's over, you're like, holy shit. I'm sure there are guys that enjoy that and, and you know, get it get a buzz off of it and um, there are many guys like professional fighters who've learned to control it that they don't even get that fight or flight while they're fighting but for someone like you that's completely trained don't you think that if you did happen to get into a real one that your adrenaline would shoot through the roof it would it absolutely would and and i'm fully aware that because i have not i mean there are a lot of things you can do that we'll create that adrenaline spike and we'll simulate, but I've not crossed that threshold. I've not been there where the consequences are, you know, my life, my health, right. I've not gotten to that point and you can condition that out, but my reasons for martial arts are not primarily self-defense. Uh-huh. And this is one of the things sure. that's often debated in that, in our community is what's the purpose of martial arts. 
most people aren't going to be under threat every day. Right. But the other things that happen with their martial arts, you know, that give you these skills to deal with life. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's there every day. Sure, sure. And I get that. And I think that's why I want my children doing it. And I don't want them to ever fight. You know, you love your kids and you don't want them to ever go through that. And yeah, maybe a fight here or there will teach them some lessons and get them. But I'd rather them just be prepared and never have to. So, exactly. So um, it's like – it's weird. I'm I'm not for gun control, but I'm also for gun safety laws. Like I really believe in – you know that we have an issue in this country and this is going to get highly political here. Um, I believe we have an issue and there is – there is guns are part of the problem guns are part of the problem of a major 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 problem there are there a, a portion of the problem mental illness is a part of it there's so many things that go into what when we have our mass shootings in america i am not for guns i'm not against guns i am for gun safety and you know we all i went i called zach and i was like hey teach me how to shoot because i think Everyone should know how to handle a gun. I think if more people knew how to handle a gun, there might be less problems. Um, I I like knowing how dangerous it is, how quickly someone can die from it, how um, that I never want one in my home. Mm. But I like knowing that in a horrible situation, if I pick that gun up, I know how to handle it. And I also know... That just like martial arts, just like stand up, just like surfing or whatever I do, that you're not going to be able to do it unless you're well, well trained also, which I think right. people need to know that when they buy a gun, that doesn't mean you're going to be able to use it and or use it well. You know, like here I am standing at a target with nothing around me and I'm aiming at it and I can only hit it three out of 15 times. And how far away were you? Yeah, like 20 feet right now. What are you going to do in a situation where a, you know, a person is attacking you in your home and you have two, a millisecond to defend yourself and you've right. got to grab this thing, load this thing, or maybe it is loaded and point it and shoot it and fire. There's a lot to that. Right. One of my favorite drills when I'm traveling around, when I'm teaching, um, because a lot of martial arts schools don't teach anything that evokes that adrenaline response and, this is this is a good good anecdote for what you're talking about here. The idea somebody breaks into your home. Oh, I'm I'm just going to right the moment that word just comes in. You're probably oversimplifying. I'm just going to grab this gun that's on the other side of the house in the safe that is unloaded and defend my family. Well, the the numbers don't add up on that. But let's pretend that that gun is under your pillow and yeah. you're ready to deploy. Stress response is so limiting. So this drill that I'll teach people, uh, we call it dark alley. So I'll, I'll take a class, I'll split it in half and I have people line up facing each other. And then I pull one person out, put them at the top of the line, turn them around and I'll go through and pick roughly half the people and say, you're, you know, you're an attacker, you're an attacker, you're an attacker, you're an attacker. Take that person back at the top of the line. They turn and they're going to walk through. They don't know who the attackers are. Now the attacker can go at super low speed, just, you know, like a simple punch to the face or something that is not even going to make contact. And everybody knows the rules ahead of time. So I'll start with this super basic rule set. Attackers, you're limited to a single punch. You cannot make contact. And I watch people who have been training for 10, 15, 20 years fall apart. Yeah. Because now the, the, the unpredictability is so high. Their adrenaline is through the roof. And they shake and they panic. And no, it's not everyone. And, and anybody who knows me knows I'm an advocate for martial arts. I'm not attacking martial arts. But unless you're willing to train at that level, mm-hmm. it's not going to work. Yeah. You, ha- you have to train the way you want to respond. Mm-hmm. And if you're always training at a very controlled level, how do you take it up the next level? Same whether, you know, CrossFit, firearms, martial arts if you don't know how to respond under stress it's funny when the fires came through my neighborhood um everything that i thought living where i live knowing i'm in a fire prone area everything i thought that was going to happen didn't happen 
and nothing. What did you think was going to happen? I thought that the firemen were going to, I heard they drive down the street with a megaphone telling you to evacuate. They are going to knock on your door, make sure you're out of your house. Uh, there will be uh, people, uh, firemen or policemen or policemen directing traffic, telling you which way to get out of the canyons. And what actually happened? Yo-yo, they call it. You're on your own. You're on your own. And more and more as I get older and I experience these things, I lived through 9-11. I was there when that happened in New York City. I was through these fires. Like, I used to think, you don't really need this shit. Nothing really happens to you. Bullshit. You need to be ready. You need to be prepared. You need to be a fucking alpha male. Because there's a need for alphas when this shit happens. When shit goes down, people pull together. There's stuff that... So, and I'm not saying everyone needs to be an alpha. There's definitely a place for people being compassionate and people taking care of it. But we don't live in a safe space. There aren't going to be people holding your hands and taking care of you. You're fucked. You're on right, your own. Because those other people are taking care of themselves. Yeah. If you're a firefighter and your job is to go drive down Eddie F Street and let him know that there's a fire or go <laughs> handle your own family. Yeah. What are you going to choose? I mean, they're, yeah, they're, they're, duty matters, yeah. and, and doing a good job matters, and, and that pride, but you're going to protect your own. And there were many, many canyons where the firemen wouldn't go up because they're like, if we go up there, someone's going to need to save us. Mm-hmm. And so you need to just, – just doing this – I was practicing the, the, the rescuing in the ocean the other day, and they said to me, you know, like, you need to – I had to learn all these hand signals for the jet ski to come get me. And they were like, you need to let us know because you're putting us in danger when we're coming to get you. So we need to know at what level, you know, like there's a sign like I need help. There's a sign like I'm fucked, guys. Right. Get in here and save me. And there's I'm OK. And you need to train and be prepared in all these. Like, I just feel like. For the longest time in my life, I'm like, eh, you know, I don't need to do this shit. This is, I focus on what I do. I do stand up. I just make people laugh. That's my job in life. And then when these fires happened, I was like, shit, I got to get my wife out of here. I got to go pick up my friend who has a, who has a broken heel and get him and all his animals in the car. I need to get out of here. I don't know which way to go. I need to communicate with these people. I need, and more and more, I'm realizing the, it was funny. I one time had dinner with John Mayer, the uh, singer, and he's all about, he said, like, life's all about surviving mm-hmm. and you got to be a survivalist and you have to learn. He knows Krav Maga and he was telling me, you need to know all this shit because you need to survive life. And the more training, the more attributes right. you can get, the more are going to make you live longer, survive longer, take care of your family longer. You can be overprepared yeah. or you can be underprepared. Yeah. You'll never be perfectly prepared because that requires a crystal ball yeah. that none of us have. I will always err on the side of being overprepared. And I've had friends and, and girlfriends freak out at some of the choices that I make mm-hmm. because I trust my gut. I trust my instincts. Oh, sure. I, I, yeah. I believe firmly in that, whether you want to call it a sixth sense or whatever. If do I you start, ever, Did you ever read Gavin DeBecker, Gift of Fear? No. Oh, you'd love it. That's what he talks about, the sixth sense that you have. He said, trust it. It's right. It's, when you talk to people who have been assaulted, mm-hmm. if, they go so, if, the, if the assault is the result of some choice that they made that might not be a typical choice, you know, I chose to go down this alley this way or, you know, I parked my car in this different parking lot, often, not always, but often they will say, something told me not to do this, but I ignored it. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I teach when I teach self-defense is – do not ignore that feeling because what is the consequence? You know, that's what Gavin DeBecker's thing is too. He's like, don't ignore that feeling. But I have that feeling all the time. So I have to ignore So then it. it's learning to explore that feeling and what is it really saying? You know, there's a difference between chronic anxiety and fear or, um, you know, a victim mentality that a lot of people have. And, oh, this is really my, you know instincts buzzing and saying something is different here and the more time you spend in high pressure situations the more you can suss out the difference in those feelings i think i think you're right there because uh you know when i read when i was reading his book and he said that you know you'll feel the hairs on your neck go up and you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that um but then there are times like when i'm going surfing and i just have this feeling like 
uh, it's probably sharky out there. I shouldn't go out there. And I'm like, that's an irrational fear. I need to put that fear away. Yes, there's a one in some million chance that I could get. And if I got attacked, I'd be like, I should have, you know, I knew I had that feeling. Well, I have that feeling every single time, you know, like it, it exists. Right. It's, it's, it's not, it's not a, I don't think that's an irrational fear. I think it's, it's risk mitigation. You know, there are certain places that I've heard you talk about that, you know, you get there and you, and you call it, I'm not going in there. That doesn't feel safe. Yeah. But this other place I know is safe because I've, I've never heard of a surfer, you know, yeah. getting bit here. And that's, I mean, life is risk mitigation. Sure. There's not a good, if, if I cross the street, there's a chance I'm going to get hit by a car, sure. but there's a far lower chance if I look and see if there's a car right, right, coming. Right, right, right. Yeah. So it's about balancing those actions versus the potential reactions. Yeah, it's, it's just I was having this nutrition argument with a friend and he was like, hey, we're all going to die. And I'm like, yeah, but you're, you're lessening your chances by eating healthy. You know, of, uh, you're going to live a longer life. And he's like, yeah, I know people that are really healthy that die. And you're going to go, sure. Sure, there's aberrations. There's, there's definitely people that ate really healthy that died young. And there's people that ate shitty that lived long. I think that's people trying to justify not taking responsibility for oh, their yeah. actions. I don't think that's actually their belief. I think they don't want to put in the work. Uh, I think they, they don't want to put in the work. But I also think that we all – we all kind of float on these, you know, hang on to these ideas that, uh, that get us through the day. You know, it's like, you know, I'll go, you, you talk yourself into things when I'm surfing and I think shark, I go, well, no one's ever been bit here. There's kelp here. I'm safe around the kelp. When they want to eat that, you know, the French fries with gravy and cheese, they're going, I, I know this guy who lived to be 95 that ate McDonald's every day. And it's just their way of telling their mind to, okay, assuage that fear of that I'm going to die from eating shitty all the time. And it's, it's, uh, I know because I do it in situations many, many times, like I said. So I don't know if it's so much they don't want to do the work as, um, it's just the way they placate themselves. It's, it's a similar mindset that, that comes up when we have the subject of self-defense, you know, Oh, well, what, what are the chances that you're going to get this? You know, what are the chances that you're going to go here and someone's going to try to kill you? Well, they're very small. Otherwise I wouldn't go there. Right. But the chances of eating that, that big Mac, you know, seven times a week for the next 40 years, having an impact is pretty high. You know, it's, it's risk mitigation. I'm going to, and I take it back. I'm going to be overprepared or I'm going to be underprepared. That's how I do everything. It's statistics, statistics, statistics. I was, uh, it's funny, like looking at like the sports I want my kids to do. My daughter loves horses, loves them. And, uh, we have everyone in our neighborhood has horses and I wanted to get her into riding. And I'm very like anti motocross, not motocross, motorcycles. My, my best friend died on a motorcycle, uh, so that's my go-to. I just remember Bob. Bob died. Yeah. That's what I know about motorcycles. But I started looking into what are the most dangerous sports. Equestrian, number Horseback one. riding. Yeah. Number one most dangerous sport. And I'm like, do I want my daughter riding? I had a horse try to kill me in the ocean in Jamaica once. What do you mean? I was riding, riding a horse. I was on a, a one of these planned yeah. sort of things. And you don't even have to hold the reins. The horses just kind of plug along. I used to ride horses as a kid. And there's a section where we're riding through the ocean. I'm like, oh, this is friggin' awesome, you know, horseback riding in the ocean in Jamaica. I mean, they're snapping pictures of you. It's super yeah. cool. I'm up to my waist. And then this fucker decides that he's going to rear up and try uh, to knock uh, me off. And I'm like, uh, you didn't cover this in the, in the initiation. Yeah, yeah. And, it, well, and if it rears up and falls on you, oh, my God. It was not. Uh, Did you go off? Barely held on. But if you fell off, you were in the water, too. What, like a couple feet? Uh, chest high. Oh, you you would have been okay. But it's if the horse falls on you is where you're in the trouble. Right. right. And I, I don't know what a horse does if it falls uh, over in the water. I'm assuming it, it kicks a lot. My, my neighbor that tries to get me to ride with her all the time, she's, you know, she, she likes to have her horses exercise. She's like, right, come with me, come with me. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm like, I can handle it. I know if a horse reared up, I'd jump off. You know, that would hurt like hell. You could break a, knit, a neck, hip, anything, arm. <laughs> but, you know, it's probably worth it. Trails are great. 
I'm think about it. Then one day she comes back. She's wearing a sling. I'm like, I broke my wrist. I need surgery. I'm like, what happened? She's like, there was a snake in the trail and the horse freaked Isn't out. Isn't that a and- huge percentage of what gets them to rear up? They yeah. come on a snake. And- yeah, snakes are scary and they're all over the place. So, um, you know, I'm just like, yeah, I think that's where I start evaluating and start going, doing like the mathematical equations yeah. and going, I don't ride a motorcycle. I wear a seatbelt. I... Uh, Probably not going to ride horses. That's about it. I mean, I'd parachute before I'd ride a horse. Probably statistically safer. I rode a water slide the other day. Uh, the Great Wolf Lodge we took my daughter to for like like a birthday party. And uh, the kids are all riding. The kids go to the arcade. And my wife's like, come on, let's go ride this, like the biggest, baddest slide there is. And I was like, all right. And she brings one of her friends and four people can go on it, but we only had three. And it's that one that you go in, all of a sudden you just go down this yeah. like yeah. really steep thing that then goes into a funnel. Mm-hmm. And it's like a half pipe as you like go down the funnel and funnel out at the bottom. So I'm back to the cliff and yeah, I was scared, but I just did that thing where I'm like, you can do anything. You're fine. Nobody dies here. What's the, and I made sure I didn't Google cause I'm sure someone has died. <laughs> So we go over the like falls, like down the steep thing. And then we just shoot up this wall and I hear her friend do this blood curdling scream that is, I don't think a woman could scream like that unless they were watching their child get decapitated. (laughs) Like it was the loudest scream I've ever heard. And, And I was like, what the, like it scared me how bad she screamed but i was like holy shit like i like i talking about like statistically like then i went and sure someone's died not not there um i managed to flip one of those one of those i thought about that i said to my wife i go you know if i was here with yeah. all my friends we'd probably do that six or seven times that's exactly we, what happened until we figured out yeah how to i gotta go in faster not yeah and it it went up the side banked flipped and those things are heavy they come down on you and i come tumbling out the bottom and the girl watching the bottom was like glassy eyed she saw a lawsuit coming yeah because that's that's all i thought i'm like we got to a point where like you feel it almost come off like airborne like at the top of the transition and i'm like i have a feeling we could figure out how to get that to the (laughs) point where it is going too fast i mean they they had a weight limit of um I figured it out like I think it was like if there were 475 pound men on it, you're at the weight limit. Yep. Like You can't go over that. So like most of my friends, if we got on there, they'd be like, uh, one of you's got to get off. So you were on there with, I think, what is it? Uh, three. Was it 650? I forget how much weight, but um, I'm just realizing I got to get ready for my show. Sure. Um, this has been awesome. Been yeah, very been interesting. Fun. Thanks for having me. Uh, no, it was great. Very informative and interesting. I always say, like, uh, you know, I love when the show's informative and we get stuff that, uh, you know, people out here we rare, rarely ever talk about uh, martial arts. So it was really nice. And uh, uh, where can they find you? Sure. Um, Whistle Kick is is my company. So. What is that? Uh, we make martial arts protective equipment okay. and uniforms and a bunch of things. We do a ton of content, you know, podcasts and video and, and stuff like that. So is it uh, whistlekick.com? Whistlekick.com will get you to everything. Uh, if you want to search the podcast, martial arts radio, okay. we'll get you there. And uh, Are you on Instagram? Yeah, whistlekick is the brand. And then if you want to find me personally, is that, is that Jeremy you, Lesniak. Is that what you do full time? Uh, beyond full time, I do a couple other things. Okay. You know, some... We Some, all do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's hard to have just one job anymore. Oh, it's impossible. Um, okay. And, uh, well, thanks for doing the show. I appreciate it. Um, you guys know what to do now. Rate, review, comment, and uh, check out my show schedule at eddieift.com. I don't know when this is coming out, so I don't know where I'll be, but there's a lot of crazy stuff coming up. Tons and tons of shows. So eddieif.com. Thank you, Jeremy Lesniak. Uh, Sorry, Gordon Wagner and Garth Willoughby.